Please open up your Bible to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. We've been making our way through the book of Colossians for several weeks now. This morning we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The term struggle is thrown around frequently in Christian circles. Uh, various things that we struggle with. Oftentimes, it's used to reference various sins that we're struggling to fight. It might be relationships that we're struggling with or ministries that we're struggling to get off the ground or ministries that are struggling to be effective. There are lots of different ways that Christians struggle and strive, things that we pursue Well, this morning, we're going to have the benefit of looking at Paul's personal struggle. What is he striving for? Last week, he talked about his striving on behalf of the Colossians, according to the power of Christ working mightily in him. Well, what we're going to see this morning is the specifics of his struggle. We're going to see the great struggle of a faithful minister. The great struggle of a faithful minister, the the great struggle, the intense striving of a faithful servant of the Lord. So let's look together at Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Paul says this, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf. And for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Would you pray with me? God, this morning as we look at your word and we observe the the right strivings, the right struggle of a faithful servant. Lord, I pray that we would have soft hearts before you to see what we must about you and your greatness and your sufficiency. And Lord, that we would be eager to want to align our own personal struggles with what is right before you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul shares his great struggle on behalf of the church. Paul shares his great struggle on behalf of the church. In our passage, we see specific struggles or strivings, which Paul references in verse 29 of chapter 1, where Paul is sharing with his readers his struggle for them, his striving. And now what we're going to see in chapter 2 is the specific pastoral struggles or striving that Paul is experiencing. Again, Paul, as we saw last week, has demonstrated how he is a faithful and trustworthy minister, a faithful and trustworthy servant on behalf of Christ. But now he's going to get particularly personal. He's now going to share the specific things he struggles with or what he struggles for, what he strives for in his ministry as a minister on behalf of Christ. This is what is on his heart. This is the the specific pastoral burden of a faithful minister, a faithful servant of the church. This is what is on his mind, not in regards to his ministry at large only, but specifically for these people to whom he is writing. He is giving a personal example of the struggling that he talks about, which he is intentionally exerting himself towards. Paul begins chapter 2 stating, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have. And Paul's point here is not to exalt his efforts or make his readers feel guilty because of how hard he's working, right? As if you made dinner 
And you want to make sure everybody at the table knows how hard you labored at making dinner. That's not what he's doing here. He's not exalting his efforts. He's working to demonstrate, rather, the pastoral care that is coming behind his instruction. He's he's working to demonstrate the pastoral care that is coming behind his instruction. Have you ever had somebody go way above and beyond to do something for you? And they came to you and shared, I don't know if you noticed, but but I did this and I did it, I did it for you. And you're just taken back. What you would you would do this for me? How kind, how who am I that you would do this? That's what Paul's going after. He's he's demonstrating his his personal pastoral care and burden as a faithful servant of the church for these individuals. And he says, though I haven't seen your face, you haven't seen my face personally, nor I yours, I want you to know how much I genuinely care about your spiritual health. This takes the general statements about his labors as a trustworthy and faithful minister and, and personalizes it all the more. Narrowing it down to his great struggle on behalf of the church, but especially for the Colossians, as well as those in Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen his face. If you remember last week in verse 29, Paul says he is striving. Here he uses the same word in noun form for the word struggle, which is the word that we get, if you remember, agony from. This is his exertion of himself rooted in his pastoral burden for these believers. And he says, I want you to know about this struggle. And he adds how great a struggle. This is not a peripheral ministry for Paul. This is an an internal effort on their behalf, intentional effort. Paul's heart was committed to the care of these individuals. And so he works and strives and struggles for their care. This was his heartbeat to see not only souls converted, but souls matured. To see these believers, every man complete in Christ, so much that there is an intense, great struggle within Paul on behalf of these believers. Paul's greatest agenda was for other spiritual good, and it seems it it doesn't matter so much to Paul what it costs him physically or circumstantially. Remember verse 24 of chapter 1, where Paul says he actually rejoices in his sufferings for their sake. Physical hardship and suffering for the purpose of building up other believers wasn't a threat to what he was trying to accomplish. He recognized personal hardship and suffering is oftentimes God's means of building up his people. So often we get this backwards. We squeeze our, our service of the church into the gaps of our lives of where it is convenient and easy. We create so little margin in our lives and so many commitments that we exalt over our obligation to one another in the church. Unwilling to make even simple sacrifices for each other. Paul here rejoices in suffering for the sake of other believers. What a helpful reminder to keep in front of us. To have intentional, sacrificial striving for the benefit of one another. Paul's writing the Colossians, yet he makes clear to them this concern is not only for them personally, but also for those who are in Laodicea. Laodicea was only about 10 to 12 miles from Colossae. It is likely uh, being that this, this close as a neighboring community, there would have been a good amount of interaction between the two churches, the two communities. They would have been facing very similar struggles and issues. Paul actually instructs that this letter be read in the Laodicean church in chapter 4, verse 16 of Colossians. And yet this expansion of his care doesn't fully demonstrate his concern as he expands it even further when he says to all those who have not personally seen my face. This seems to be a a reference that expands his concern to the whole Lycus Valley. Uh, 
including Colossae, Laodicea, and Aeropolis. This is the, the reality and intensity of Paul's pastoral burden for other believers, for the church, and his struggle the particular struggles that he has for believers he hasn't even met yet, many of them. And then he's going to describe or explain the specifics of this struggle. He's going to share the content of his great struggle, and that's what we're going to see this morning. And maybe a question to consider now and ponder as we dive in more to the specifics of this passage, what is the internal turmoil in your heart relating to the church. Now, I will say this to you, Grace Bible Church, this morning. I do not believe that this passage should come to Grace Bible Church as an exhortation of correction. But hopefully it will come as an affirmation of God's grace and work in your life as you demonstrate and struggle intentionally in self-sacrificial care for one another. Hopefully it will come as an affirmation of God's grace in your life and an encouragement to excel still more. So as we consider that, a question that we'll ponder as we dive more into the specifics of this passage, what is the internal turmoil in your heart relating to the church? What is the internal turmoil in your heart relating to the church? What is the internal struggle or striving that you experience for God's people? What occupies your thoughts? What is the wrestling that goes on in your heart in relation to the church? Paul shares his great struggle on behalf of the church. And the first expression of this struggle is his desire, number one, for the encouragement of their hearts. The encouragement of their hearts. The first expression of Paul's great struggle is his desire for the encouragement of his readers' hearts. Look at verse 1. That their hearts may be encouraged. I'm sorry, verse 2. That their hearts may be encouraged. This is the first objective of his labor, of his struggle. And then he's going to give two ways of how he desires their hearts to be encouraged. When Paul references the heart here, he, he's not referring to an emotional appeal of encouragement that simply warms the person. We talk about the heart frequently at Grace Bible Church, the need to shepherd our heart. And we know that the heart is the command central of a person. Uh, the heart is the core and the center of an individual as the seat of the mind and the emotions and the will. This is an encouragement that reaches the deepest part of an individual and saturates the entirety of that individual. That's what Paul wants to be encouraged. That's his struggle. That's his desire. To encourage can have a variation of meanings from coming alongside to comfort or to strengthen. And here it seems to be the idea of a, of a strengthening or an, an instilling of courage in his readers. Paul doesn't seem so much after an emotional comfort, but a strengthening of the person to endure and grow and persevere in the face of trials and particularly false teaching. Paul is seeking to fortify their hearts. He is seeking to see them strengthened in their inner man. And then Paul gives a description of how this courage of the heart or strengthening of the inner man is to take place. And in verse 2, it is being united in love. Look again at verse 2. Being united in love. He says, having been knit together in love. Paul says, having been knit together in love or being united in love, how will their hearts be encouraged? Firstly, being brought together or united or knit together. This word can also be used to describe the body being held together by its various sinews. In chapter 3, verse 14, Paul gives the command, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Unity. 
And here we see the similar uniting effect of genuine biblical love for one another. You could say the the sphere in which the body is to be knit together is love. If the church is united on on a bunch of fronts but neglects true love, the church is failing. And making itself especially vulnerable to spiritual attack. Paul has already commended the Colossians regarding their love for all the saints in verse 4 of chapter 1. But his commendation does not preclude him from making known this struggle of his to see them encouraged and strengthened, to see their hearts strengthened as they are continuing to be united together in love. In the body of Christ, there is to be a a constant, intentional practice of self-sacrificing, others-preferring, sin-forgiving, preference-deferring, patient-enduring, kindness-expressing, offense-overlooking, best-assuming, Christ-imitating love for one another. This is what we're to be united in. Biblical Christ imitating love. And Paul struggles that this might be in others. Those he he hasn't even met yet. Those who hasn't haven't seen his face. And this isn't something where Paul is struggling to see this in others because th- then it will be present in him. If others act this way, that will help me out. Paul in his struggle is actually expressing that this kind of love exists in him. And if we are to long for this rightly in one another, it has to be present in us. Our responsibility in this isn't to go make sure everyone else is loving currently, but rather to love others intentionally and selflessly. Some, sometimes we have the idea that, that others need to love me well, and then I will extend myself in love for others. That isn't Paul's heartbeat at all. He simply desires these believers to be hearts strengthened, to have their hearts strengthened, to be encouraged as they are knit together in love. So back to the question I mentioned we should consider as we work through this. What is the internal turmoil of your heart relating to the church? Do you struggle? Do you intentionally labor to see hearts encouraged that we might be knit together in this kind of love as a church? Sometimes I think we long for spiritual maturity in others because we're actually selfish and we want to benefit from their love. Paul's circumstances make clear and demonstrate his motives are are not selfish. He genuinely desires, longs, agonizes for the spiritual maturity in these believers simply because he longs to see them mature in Christ, complete in Christ. If you remember, he is in prison far removed from them directly. He simply longs to see them mature. There's no expectations of return in him. He loves Christ, he loves Christ's church, and he wants to see believers mature in Christ. What a great example. Paul earnestly labors, intentionally strives, he struggles that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love. And then he says, look again at verse 2. It says that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself. First, we saw that he, Paul, desires that the believer's hearts would be strengthened as they are united in love. And next, we're going to see Paul's desire for their hearts to be strengthened, expressed as they have assurance of understanding. Have assurance of understanding. 
Love is the cause of the union believers are to have, and the effect of this unity in love is having assurance of understanding. They are to be strengthened in their heart, instilled with courage, having assurance of understanding. Paul says, and then says this, and then the word that he uses is is an attaining. It's added by the translators there to smooth out the translation. Let me, let me say that again. He says that their hearts may be encouraged having been knit together in love. And, and then do you see if you're in the NASB attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding? The word attaining is added by translators to smooth out the translation. Uh, This is to keep growing to understand in abundance God's word. That's what this means. Uh, Paul here is saying that there is a wealth that comes to the believer from the full assurance of understanding. This is a complete understanding of spiritual matters. It's to attain to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. This is to keep growing to understand in abundance God's word. This is, this is a highlight of the fullness or depth or completeness of knowledge of God, particularly Christ. Uh, Paul used the same root word in verse 6 of chapter 1, and then he uses it again in verse 9, referring to knowledge of God's will. And in verse 10, it was knowledge of God, and here it is knowledge of God's mystery. Do you see that in verse 2? Attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. This is his desire, and all of these things are related, and and Paul is laboring and striving that they may attain to or possess or have an assurance of understanding, that they may know truth and believe it and, and hold to it, that there would be a maturity in regards to their understanding of God's truth, knowing it is indeed from God. And for the believer to have this assurance or certainty in God's wisdom and in God's truth and God's revelation, it it instills courage in the life of the believer, in their heart, in their inner man, in their deepest being. And the desire for Paul is that these believers would continue growing in their understanding, that they would have it in fullness and in completeness. And this understanding, as Paul describes, a wealth It is riches. It's not only wealth, but he says it's all wealth. Have you ever, have you ever referenced or even read a Bible verse that was extremely clear to someone and and they just didn't agree? And, And you appealed to them from scripture and they accused you of being prideful or arrogant There seems to be this thought in some that to make a confident assertion regarding biblical truths is prideful. Now, we are all capable of holding to biblical truths in a prideful manner. We're all capable of holding to biblical truths with arrogance and and pride, but, but that is a problem within us, not an issue of biblical truth. God actually says in Isaiah 66, this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite of spirit and trembles at my word to humble yourself under what God has revealed in scripture. God desires this for his people to have a fullness of understanding, a true knowledge. He doesn't long for a wishy-washy theology in his people where we say what we believe, but we can't ever really be sure there's been godly people on both sides of the fence. And so we just kind of take middle ground on everything. We can't take that approach. God wants us to be sure of things. That is why he has revealed truth in scripture. He has not revealed truth in scripture that we might be further confused or ignorant or in the dark about him. He has revealed truths in scripture that we might have a fullness of understanding that he desires for his people. 
He wants to make, he wants us to be sure of things. That is why he has revealed truth in scripture. He has given to us the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to what he has clearly revealed that we might have full confidence and understanding and a true knowledge that for the believer is all wealth. To know what God says about himself, to know what God has revealed about Jesus Christ is all wealth. And our humility is to be expressed not in inconclusiveness about what God has clearly revealed, but it is to be expressed as we are under God's word with trepidation that we would get it right and that we would understand what is true that God has revealed. Not an openness to others' perspectives or opinions to their truth. We want God's truth. That is where all the wealth lies. There is no virtue in giving credence to man's opinions and thoughts. We must humble ourselves before God and what he has said, what he has revealed about himself. All the wealth lies in this. Did you hear about the man from Colorado He played the same lottery numbers for 30 years, and then he won with those same numbers twice in one day. Two million dollar, two one million dollar jackpots, Powerball jackpots. That is attaining wealth. That's attaining wealth. That is nothing, nothing compared to what the believer attains when gaining a full assurance of understanding, a full confidence of what we know regarding God, particularly, as we'll see in a moment, Christ. Uh, Let's keep going. What Paul goes on to say is extremely helpful for us in knowing what he's really getting at in regards to this full assurance of understanding. Look at the end of verse 2. He says, in attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting or producing in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. Paul repeats the idea of understanding, but specifies it. This full understanding is about Christ himself. Paul says this full assurance of understanding results in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself. It makes sense why Paul would go into such specificity regarding the person of Jesus in chapter 1. He wants to see every believer, as he says in verse 28 of chapter 1, complete in Christ We'll see next week he calls the believer to walk in Christ. And here he wants believers to have hearts that are encouraged as they come to a true knowledge of the person of Christ. And look at what Paul says in verse 3. In whom, that is Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Do you believe this? Do you believe this wonderful statement about Jesus? Do you believe that in Christ is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? Christ is fully sufficient and supreme for all wisdom and knowledge. There's nothing outside of Christ that gives you an advantage of wisdom and knowledge. True wisdom and knowledge is a treasure, and all of the treasure of wisdom and knowledge is found in the person of Jesus Christ. This wisdom and knowledge is found exclusively in Jesus. It is hidden in him, but it is not out of reach. It is hidden in Christ, but the mystery of Christ is not a secret. The cat is out of the bag, and for anyone who will humble themselves under Christ, anyone who will bow in repentance before Christ, the treasury doors are are swung open wide. The safe is unlocked. The riches are attainable. There is for you a relationship with Jesus, and in, in this, a fullness of knowledge 
that comes from Jesus and the treasures within that of wisdom and understanding. Do you struggle knowing how to navigate life? Do you not have an answer for the the purpose of your life, the purpose or reasons for the things happening to you and by you and around you? Do you know Christ? Do you know Jesus? In him is something so amazing. There is, first of all, as Paul referenced in chapter 1, a reconciling work that Jesus offers through his sacrifice on behalf of all who believe. All of those who are his and in him for his children is the treasure that is wisdom and knowledge. Jesus offers forgiveness of sins, reconciliation to God. Jesus paid the perfect full price for the sin of everyone who would repent and believe upon him. And in addition to the the miraculous gift of forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to God, there is also a fullness of wealth of wisdom and understanding, a, a knowledge that is in Christ Listen, there are no human solutions to spiritual problems. And in Christ, there is a supreme solution to our sin. There's wisdom, insight, guidance, understanding, knowledge for how to navigate the various issues and struggles circumstances, trials that we find ourselves in, in Christ. And there is nothing for life and godliness that comes from the world. And everything for life and godliness is found in Jesus. He is the ultimate treasure. Did you notice that Paul lists back to back what many would say compete or in essence work against each other? Paul talks about unity and love, and then he talks about assurance of understanding. He talks about being united or knit together in a strong, biblical, Christ-like love. And then he talks about the benefit, strengthening the hearts of God's people when they have a full assurance of understanding, a strong conviction and belief and confidence in what God has revealed about Christ. When they have strong theology and diligent love, you see, oftentimes people want to pit pit these things against one another. Uh, we're, We're a church that focuses on love. We don't get caught up in all of that haughty biblical theology stuff. Scripture never presents right biblical truth, correct theology as being a hindrance or in competition with biblical love. They actually complement each other. So to say you're puffed up with knowledge, therefore you lack love, is a false contrast. If someone is puffed up in arrogance in their knowledge, they don't actually possess right biblical thinking. These things complement one another. No one, no one stands proud when holding a right view of Christ, and God desires his people to have a fullness of assurance of understanding in regards to the person of Christ. We can know Christ intimately, and we can have confidence in what God has revealed regarding Jesus. Paul longs, he he strives, he struggles for hearts to be encouraged as they are united in love and have an assurance or an ever-growing understanding of truth. Again, what is, what's your struggle? What's your struggle? Do you find yourself dwelling more on what others aren't doing for you or longing for others' true spiritual maturity simply because you... You long to see them grow in the Lord. 
I couldn't help but think about PNG, about Papua New Guinea. And those in the tribe of Maruroro and in the surrounding tribes and thinking about our struggle as a church, our striving to see them come to know Christ and to mature in Christ. We should long for that. We should pray for that. You have longed for that. You have prayed for that. You have sacrificed as a church financially, resources-wise, time-wise. And I praise God and thank you for your sincere love as the Colossians had for all the saints. And your sincere love for those lost in the Finisterre Mountains. Your longing to see them saved and your expenditure of your own resources for their potential benefit. What a testimony of God's grace in your lives. Let us press on. Let us continue. Let us not lose sight of what's going on there, but let us persevere in our striving, in our struggle. That the gospel would be preached. That lives would be saved and transformed forgiven, reconciled, and matured. Well, Paul shares his great struggle on behalf of the church, first for the encouragement of their hearts. This encouragement comes from them being united in love and having assurance of understanding. And then next we see Paul's great struggle is for their protection from deception. His struggle is for their protection from deception. Deception. Paul now explains why he wants them to have their hearts strengthened. He, he wants them to be protected or guarded from persuasive arguments. Look at verses 4 and 5. He says, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. He goes on to say in verse 5, For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. He wants their hearts to be encouraged, and he is telling them of this struggle because he doesn't want anyone to delude them with persuasive arguments. He's warning them, don't let anyone draw you away from Jesus. Paul is protecting them from being deceived by false teaching. Have you ever wondered if calling out false teaching is really necessary? Do we, do we really have to do that? It, it gets uncomfortable at times. It is. Uh, Paul is struggling. He's laboring that these believers would be fortified in their faith, that their hearts would be encouraged, that they would be knitted together in love and have full assurance of understanding and a true knowledge pertaining to Jesus. And he's saying all of these things in verses one through three because he doesn't want false teachers to come in and deceive them regarding the reality of who Christ is. Paul says he doesn't want anyone to delude This means to deceive or to lead astray. It has the idea of one cheating by false reasoning. There are those who seek to lead astray to bring false reasoning, and they do this with persuasive arguments. It's persuasive. This is the means by which this deception takes place. This is one who talks someone into something. The wrong doctrine, these, these, this bad theology, these damning beliefs aren't always obvious. They can be subtle. They can be persuasive. And we need each other. We need people like what Paul is doing here to help us in this. Let me ask you this. Have, have you ever listened to a sermon or read a book And then you show up at small group or a a public setting and people are actually talking about that sermon or about that book and you hear them talking about it and they're bringing up point after point. You really liked this sermon or you really liked this book and, and yet you jump into the conversation all of a sudden you hear them and they're bringing up point after point that they were actually concerned with that was inaccurate with scripture. And And you're thinking two things. You're thinking, one, how did I miss this? And you're also thinking, 
I'm glad I didn't speak up. <laughs> I thought it was really good, but oh, they're, they're actually right. This is error. This is false. This is untrue. And I was persuaded. Paul's struggle here, he wants hearts to be encouraged that they would be stable, that they, they wouldn't be deceived. They wouldn't be persuaded against what is true and right about Christ. He wants their hearts to be encouraged that they would be stable, that they wouldn't be deceived. And then in verse five, as we wrap up this morning, he says, for even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Paul being in prison says, I'm absent in body, yet with them in spirit. And he's not talking about some out of body experience. He's not He's not force ghosting himself to them. But he also means more than just a sentimental you're in my thoughts. There is a unity between believers in Christ as part of his body. And Paul is recognizing the corporate identity among believers. And again, we, we feel and recognize this with our precious friends in PNG. We aren't there physically, but we are united in Christ in a bond in Christ by one spirit and into one body. We, we love our friends who are there ministering and we long to see others come to Christ. And then Paul ends with a rejoicing. There's such kind encouragement here. Look at the, the second half of verse five. Rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Epaphras gave a good report to Paul, and Paul is rejoicing in this, that they have good discipline. There is actual spiritual stability or firmness in their faith. There are spiritual victories, and yet these spiritual victories don't negate the need for spiritual encouragement and instruction. That's a helpful reminder that spiritual victories don't negate the need for spiritual encouragement and instruction. We need this. Paul has a godly struggle on behalf of these believers. He aches, he longs for them to grow in maturity in Christ, to have their hearts strengthened as they are united in love, ever growing in understanding pertaining to the person of Jesus, that they would be protected from false teaching regarding Christ. So we circle around again, what, what is your struggle? What are you struggling with right now? When you consider what has occupied your thoughts, what has caused intentional striving in your soul? What do your thoughts and actions demonstrate about your priorities, your longings, your desires? What do you labor over? Most likely, all of us would say, I've struggled with something too much and other things too little this year. Maybe you've been struggling with COVID 19. Maybe you've been struggling regarding politics. Maybe you've been struggling with social injustices. Maybe you've been struggling. For others to think like you in regards to these things. Maybe you've been struggling over unmet expectations of those around you. Maybe you've been struggling through offenses you've been unwilling to let go of and forgive. I don't want to minimize the difficulty and reality of any of the struggles that we may be going through, that you may be going through. They are hard. They can be difficult. They can be consuming at times. But Paul is in prison here. From Philippians, we know Paul is uncertain as, if, as to if he will live or die. And his struggle isn't one of curiosity about what's going to happen to him. He's not struggling with a longing for others to come remove his burden, his trial, his hardship. 
His struggle is one rooted out of selfless love that others would be strengthened in the faith. And he longs for this without any expectation of his circumstances changing or receiving anything other than the joy that comes from knowing others are growing in Christ. Let our struggle be Paul's struggle. Uh, Let's struggle to encourage each other's hearts to strengthen one another. Let's promote unity in love without expectation of anything in return. Let us spur one another on towards greater understanding of scripture and Christ. Let's bring sound and timely warnings to one another, like Paul. Not depending on our strength, but upon Christ as we fix our hearts and our minds on him. We need to remove all personal expectations of how others respond to our service or to us. And we need to long for these things in one another that Paul speaks of. We need to love each other and we can do this because of Christ We do not need to look towards the world to help us as a church in our love for one another. All wisdom and understanding is found in Christ. We must continue to see the wealth, the riches that are found in Christ. We must strive to honor him in all that we do, to be strengthened in him, to hold firm to what we know is true of what God has revealed about Jesus in his word. We need to love each other and we can do this because of Christ. Paul, he says, labors not by his own strength, but according to Christ's strength, which mightily works in him. We have hope to this end because of Jesus. He works in his people. He is working in us. And our greatest aid to all of this is Jesus himself, as in him are all the riches of wisdom and understanding. Grace Bible Church, let us resolve to live this way. Let us resolve to always keep our eyes on Christ that our hearts may be encouraged as we're knit in love, as we have full assurance of understanding regarding who Christ is, all that he has accomplished, that we would not be persuaded away from our Savior whom we love. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the tremendous treasure that is found in Christ. We thank you for Christ himself. We thank you that you have made a way for us to know you and have fellowship with you through Jesus. He is preeminent. He is awesome. He is so good. Help us to treasure him rightly and pursue him diligently. Help our hearts to be strengthened and fortified and and encouraged in your word even this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.